Okay, welcome back to Plato's Cave. With me, I have Eddie Namius. He is a professor and chair of the philosophy department at Georgia State University and an associate faculty member of the Neuroscience Institute at GSU. So Eddie, thanks for uh, joining me today. Happy to. So I read, uh, I, I came across you and your work actually listening to a really, really early episode. I think I told you of Very Bad Wizards where you talked about uh, a lot of this stuff. And I think that was from either 2016, maybe even 2015. It was a long time ago. Yep. And it, it still seems like you're working on uh, very related things to, to what was spoken about in that episode. I, I read two papers of yours, which uh, if people can get their hands on, I highly recommend because they're, they're great reads. Uh, one is called Your Brain as the Source of Free Will Worth Wanting. And the second is Why Willusionism Leads to Bad Results. Uh, to get the first one, I think you have to buy the book, but it's well it's well worth the twenty seven dollars or whatever it was. That that is a great book that everybody should buy. But I think I have pre publication drafts of both publications on my website edinomius dot com. So that is true. If you're cheap, you yeah. get it there. <laughs> that is true. If you don't ever plan to cite it in a in a paper, <laughs> just read it there. So I you know I was reading these papers, both of them. And I found myself kind of begrudgingly getting moved to your side of the argument a little bit. I, I think uh, when I, when you're I first, an incompat you're an incompatibilist. Uh, I have uh, incompatibilist leanings. I have been like dirt, just speaking to people and reading all these texts. I've been absolutely moved into a currently kind of a non standard compatibilist position. Uh, I think I think a lot of the distinctions they make are really, really important. But I think that I kind of take a John Fisher semi-compatibilist view. I, I almost don't care as much about the question of free will as I do about conditions for moral responsibility. Um, but I, I'm interested in, in talking to you about all these things today. So it I take it that I take it that a large part of your project in these papers and others is to kind of revise or or shift the conversation about about the focus on determinism and even you know more specifically neuroscience debunking any ideas that we have about free will yeah so um for for the audience that doesn't know all the terms we're throwing around already um but just remind people that you know the standard challenge to uh free will from you know the historical debate Going back to the Greeks, although it, it takes various routes through worries about God's foreknowledge or the existence of a God that creates the universe, but, but at least since the scientific revolution, people have worried about a sort of Newtonian view of physics that says everything is deterministically caused one thing after another, and if that applies to human beings, then uh, deterministically caused one thing after another such that our choices have prior causes going back at some point, something that we clearly couldn't have any control over, like the Big Bang or the state of the universe before we were born. But if it all happens in law-like ways, then we're, we're just cogs in the machine. Um, and so the incompatibilist is the person who thinks uh, that view of determinism is incompatible with the type of free will that we take ourselves to have, where we think we have open alternatives uh, of possibilities for future choice, and we have some control over what happens. So, um, so the standard threat is determinism, and part of my project going back to when I was a grad student a uh, long time ago um, <laughs> at Duke, uh, is trying to shift the debate so that we better recognize that to begin with, we should kind of see that determinism and naturalism can be pulled apart. So naturalism is just the view that we are part of the natural world in accord with the laws of nature. And you, we should immediately see that they can come apart because quantum physics is typically thought of as indeterministic, that there are some situations where given background causes, things could go one way or the other. But it's still naturalistic. Quantum events are what explain all of the natural world. So we should begin by recognizing the difference between those two things. And 
that means we should probably see that the the natural world could be unpredictable um and it could be such that uh these might happen in the brain and and at various moments of choice there might be an indeterministic event but a lot of people including lots of scientists think well that doesn't help right i mean that just means the natural world is still causing what we do but it's not determining it given prior conditions so uh part of my goal is to say if we're worried about naturalism we should recognize that it's not just the deterministic nature of causation there's something else going on and i actually think that's the way most philosophers who are incompatibilists think of it these ways uh the, these days including dirk paradigm who you mentioned they're more worried about there just being a history of causation that leads us to do what we do. So that's kind of the background picture. And, and you tell me, you know, where you want me to start convincing you or, or <laughs> others uh, to, to not worry so much about a naturalistic picture. Yeah. Well, I take it. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like another way of saying all that is you're, you're really narrowing a lot of the focus to a more local scale. Uh, you know, we've had these kind of inflated concerns about are we causa sui? Can we have contra causal free will? These kind of grand, maybe just thought up by philosophers, maybe actually worried by worried about by pre philosophical folk. You know, it's kind of an open question there, I guess. Uh, right. But but you're you're really talking about you know you you have this term that you use in the in the 2018 paper, this bypassing term. That's really the worry. There is. Um, you know, you had an example in the beginning of that paper, but it made me think about, I don't know if I mentioned, but I'm applying to grad schools right now. And yeah. I'm in the harrowing process of just waiting for every email to come in and just throwing up at every, you know, bing of my outlook. Um, and so what I, and I was, you know, kind of thinking about what you were writing through that lens, right? So what I care about is, you know, I'll be faced with a decision. Say I get into UCR and Arizona, right? And I have to choose between those two. Well, uh, you can't lose. <laughs> that, yeah, it's a great problem to have in the first right. place. <laughs> but, you know, what I'm what I'm worried about there is not whether you could trace my decision back to the Big Bang or whether I kind of created my own desires in the first place. That's, you know, not even a coherent concept. What I care about really is that my interests, my desires, my values get to be expressed through my decision and hopefully carried out in what school I attend. Well, you're already you're already a compatibilist, then, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. if if your main worry is whether or not when you make choices, your choices are being properly caused by your own mental states, your own self, as it were, your own reasons. I mean, that's what compatibilists have been trying to get us to think is important, you know, again, going back to the to the original concerns about determinism. Um, and as they pointed out from the start, there's nothing about determinism that rules out uh, the causal processes going through yourself in the right sort of way. But what has happened, I think, in the last 30, 40 years, maybe going all the way back to thinkers like Freud um, and, and then sort of the, the cognitive revolution and some of the psychology of the 70s. There's been various threats that I do call bypassing threats, threats that aren't so much about causes going back to the Big Bang, but causes that seem to bypass the very things you were just talking about, um, whether it's Freud's unconscious desires to, you know, have sex with your mom or whatever Freud was talking about, or just sort of external situational um, effects that you might not be aware of, like uh, the position of items on the shelf you're choosing from, or that it's sunny, more, oh, is it more sunny at Riverside than Arizona? I don't yeah, know. It's that probably a wash, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, something about the, the weather, or as you said in one of your your setup emails, you know whether or not some some woman that you're attracted <laughs> to maybe at, at Riverside factors that you are not aware of influencing you, and were you to become aware of them, you probably wouldn't want them to influence you. 
Once we start thinking about that kind of causation, I think we've shifted the focus away from determinism or even naturalism to looking at the specific causal stories that are going to be given to us by the relevant mind sciences, neuroscience, psychology, whatever. And that's exactly where I think the focus should be. I think what, what we need to worry about when it comes to free will is to what extent are we making choices based on our self-knowledge, based on what we take to be the, the things that should be influencing us given the types of person we want to be, the types of goals we have to succeed in philosophy in your case or whatever, or are we being caused by brain processes that bypass that or by psychological causes that bypass our our, our rationality. Um, so that's that's where I think the focus of the debate should be. But to get the debate there, you have to spend a lot of time dealing with the people, the incompatibilists, uh, or what I call the illusionists, the, the neuroscience think. No, what really matters is whether determinism or whether our brains cause everything. Um, if you're a naturalist, you wouldn't be worried at all about the fact that your brain causes everything. You would just be worried about which parts of your brain and, and you know, which, which part of the logical are playing the right role. Yeah. So, so I think I mentioned in the email, I have mixed feelings and here's where one of those mixed feelings comes in. So uh, to the question of sort of what factors that influence you, you're aware of and what you self-identify with there you know, so if I'm choosing, if I'm, I'm trying to decide between these schools or any choice, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And obviously there are going to be some factors that I'm aware of influencing that choice. And there's probably, it were definitely going to be some that I'm unaware of. I just, you know, I don't have that much self-knowledge, right? So <clears throat> it seems to me like there's this weird kind of asymmetry between factors that you endorse and factors you don't endorse. And there's kind of a positive and negative aspect to those. So if I were to discover that, you know, <clears throat> I've got all of this, you know, I've got like a spreadsheet or whatever, and I've got all these factors, I've got placement rates, I've got cost of living, I've got stipend amount, you know, all these things, right? And that's all in my conscious view. But working in the background are various other factors. You know, the thing I mentioned with you is like, pret pretend there's some girl that's there that I, I, uh, you know, I'm attracted to, but I'm trying not to let that factor in because job, job market concerns are way more pressing than that. Yeah. Right. So if, if at the end of the day, I make the decision and it turns out just from a God's eye view that the overriding factor was the presence of that girl there. Right. I would not my kind of Frankfurtian second order desire. I don't, I don't want to want to have that influence me, but it does. Mm -hmm. And that seems like, it's a, a case of bypassing. And my question to you is, are all cases of bypassing just cases in which you don't identify or you don't kind of either approve or self-identify with the cause? What, what separates bypassing from just these standard kind of background factors that we all know are going on in the background? Yeah, good question. Um, and one that doesn't have a clean answer I, I use bypassing and I mean to use it in a way that is open to various uh, interpretations, depending on um, which type of threat you may be considering. Um, and it may depend on which type of free will you're considering. And I don't think there's always going to be just, you know, one answer to what's the best, uh, the best way to understand free will when you thinking about responsibility or when we're thinking about self, you know, our self-expression, that uh, it depends what our interests are sometimes. So in the case of the example you gave, um, it looks like what you want to be influencing you is the reasons that on reflection you think are appropriate to be influencing you for a decision like where to choose graduate school. And that is consistent with Frankfurt's view uh, or Gary Watson's view that talks about the importance of, you know, choosing in light of your values, the things that in a cool, reflective, 
uh, way you you accept as influencing you. Um, and it's consistent with Fisher's view of being reasons responsive. And so on that sort of view, um, what what would threaten the degree to which your free will and you're, you're acting freely, and I, I typically take it as a notion that comes in degrees, would be influences that cause you to act in a way that conflicts with those values or those self-reflected desires that you endorse. It's tricky because on the one hand, uh, you are certainly influenced by all kinds of factors that you don't know about. All the things that you care about and value themselves are also influenced by all kinds of things you don't know about. In some cases, you don't care that they're influenced by things you don't know about, that you are who you are, you can come to be this way, you don't know how you got this way, but here you are and you kind of like it, or at least you like parts of it, and those are the ones you endorse. Um, in other cases, you do care about it. You might, you might not want to have been formed in certain ways if it involved brainwashing or some sort of enculturation process that you don't accept as a, as a, as a good way to have become a, a, the person you are. Um, but sticking with the example you're talking about, two things. First of all, notice that it would be pretty weird if in the end, from a God's eye point of view, it would be proper to say the reason you picked Riverside is because the, the girl you were attracted to is there. And the reason that would be weird is because surely that's not the only reason you picked it. You wouldn't have picked it if it were um, Georgia State's MA program where I don't even think you applied, uh, <laughs> right? So it's not, as if, it's not as if that factor is strong enough to outweigh every other factor. If it turned out to be the tiebreaker, then, you're, then it's weird, right? You're like, well, am I okay with it being the tiebreaker? And, and in the end, maybe you are, you're okay with it if, if it really was that close of a choice. Maybe you don't feel like you were bypassed in that case. You needed a tiebreaker and you didn't have anything else. But here's where the real world examples really come into play. If from a God's eye point of view, and by here, I don't mean God's eye, I mean your God's eye point of view, like if you knew everything about what was influencing you and you discovered that without the influence of this woman, who you don't think is a good reason to make your choice, you would have picked Arizona but because it had better reasons. But she was a powerful enough cause to influence you without your knowledge to make what you from a more objective standpoint think is the wrong choice that she made you she poked you in that direction. Now it looks like you have lost something we care about when it comes to free will. Is it enough to say that you're not responsible for that choice? No, I don't think so, because you still were acting on a lot of reasons that matter to you. But was it enough that you were not acting in a way that you, know, you would recognize as most in control? Yeah, I think so. So that's just one complicated example of bypassing among yeah. many other possible types of bypassing. I, I like that. Well, first of all, I did apply to a Georgia State's MA. I didn't want to tell you that and butter you up for this interview. <laughs> I, right. I, I wanted the hard hitting Eddie Nami. It's yeah. not, the, not the softened I, one. I will not let this interview influence me one way or the other. I can say, <laughs> Not confidently at all. That's what you think. We no, yeah. we don't know about lots of <laughs> ways we're influenced. But I will make an effort not to be influenced by it because that's what we try to do when we make unbiased choices. Just like we don't want to be influenced by the race or gender of applicants or by the pedigree if we think that's irrelevant to you know the quality of their writing samples. So we do actually make lots of explicit attempts to avoid being influenced by factors that from a cool reflective point of view, we think are either irrelevant or worse than irrelevant, right? They're, they're biases like race or gender that we want to avoid. And one of the most interesting areas of psychology right now is 
A, how little we know about those influences, and B, how difficult they are to avoid even when we know about them. And to me, that's where the rubber hits the road when it comes to free will and responsibility. That's so much more interesting than metaphysical questions about determinism, <laughs> right? I mean, determinism or indeterminism is truth. Who cares? We don't, we're not avoiding that. We don't have little souls floating off. And even if we did, what would that mean? How would that help to have a soul that's somehow unconnected to the causal stream? What matters is, given all the messy psychological factors influencing us, how much can we know about them and how much can we avoid being influenced by things that we, we don't think are relevant? Yeah, it's not, you have the homage to this in the subtitle, I think, of, of it's not a free will worth wanting, to use Dennis' term. It's, it's not even, so I guess in that sense, this is slightly tangential. Are you, you're at least amenable to Manuel Vargas's idea of revisionist concepts of free will then? So, you know, the, the libertarian or contra-causal sense is not even, it really shouldn't even be kind of at the center of the bullseye of concern. So, yeah, I mean, one of your questions that you sent me was about why we should care about what ordinary people think about free will. Um, so this, the, this question is, is partially asking that, right? To what extent are we, am I, is Dan Dennett, uh, or else who's a compatibilist, to what extent are we revising what ordinary people believe? Well, notice, to answer that question, we need to know what ordinary people believe. So that's one reason to do experimental philosophy and psychology on what ordinary people think about free will and, and much more importantly, responsibility and attributions of praise and blame. Um, and that's one reason that it's not like, you know, ordinary people's concepts of gravity or even, you know, validity and logic or something that's a very technical notion that the concept of free will we should care about is the one that's tied up with our normative interactions, right? Our, our, our interactions that involve whether we forgive people, whether we blame people, whether we should feel guilty, um, the sort of Strassonian, Peter Strassen uh, reactive attitudes. So that's one reason we should care about what ordinary people think, because we need to see to what degree whatever we think is viable, given our best philosophical and scientific research, uh, to what extent, you know, the ordinary views and the normative practices that we engage in are viable. And if they're not viable, and they need to be revised, how much of a revision is it? And how do we pull it off? Right? I mean, as I say in that paper that you, you talked about, the, the uh, free will worth one in brain, whatever it's called, the, <laughs> the free will, the brain is the source of a free will worth one in, yeah. um, which is an homage to, to Dan Dennett's uh, view of that we should, we should develop a notion of free will worth one in. Um, that in order to, um, in order to sort of engage with ordinary practices, we need to understand whether we're revising in a way that is going to be something that totally undermines ordinary practices in the way that, say, Josh Green book says is happening in, in his paper for the law of neuroscience changes everything, nothing and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm terrible with titles. <laughs> uh, and um, or is the change going to be less radical and more of a sort of metaphysical pairing away of mm -hmm. notions of free will that, you know, may be a hangover from a certain religious tradition or something. And obviously my view is it's, it's less significant of a revision. It's more like what happened when we shifted from a, uh, a Ptolemaic worldview with the earth at the center of the universe to a Copernican worldview where the earth goes around the sun, which people use as an example of like, oh, everything changed, the whole worldview changed. But that's not quite right. It didn't change like ordinary people's experience of their lives day to day. 
It changed what their religion said. Many of these people weren't reading what their religion said anyway, so it didn't matter even if they were Christian. Um, but they woke up in the morning and they saw the sunrise and they saw the sunset. And yeah, their experience was that must mean that the sun goes around the earth. But in the, you know, say the 1700s, when we were raising our children within a Copernican Galilean worldview, as I did with my own children, once they were kind of old enough to know what I was talking about, I explained to them, no, actually we're spinning and the earth and the sun is still, and it looks like it's rising because we're spinning into the path of the sun. And then of course, their natural question is, well, why don't we feel like we're moving? To which I say, well, have you ever been in a fast moving car on the highway? Do you feel like you're moving? And the kids, you know, by age four or five are quick to understand that no, once you're going at a certain speed, if you're not accelerating or braking, you don't feel like you're moving. And they get the analogy that Galileo helped us see. And that's it. The revolution's over for them, right? <laughs> yeah. They're five years old and, and the revolution's over. We're, mm. we're not the center of the universe. And it makes almost no difference for their day-to-day -day lives. Similarly, I think we're already raising our children to believe the brain is everything, at least in you know, the educated world. And I find with my students these days, and certainly with my own children, they're not freaked out at all by the idea that our brain is everything. Yeah. Right? And so that's the revolution. And now we just need to figure out whether our brain gives us the kind of powers for rational conscious control that we experience ourselves with that. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, it... <laughs> It does seem, I think I, I said something about this is almost like a, um, this is almost like a debunking test. You know, when you, when you show people scans of the brain and you say, don't, you know, you fool, don't you realize it's all there in the scan and people's reaction is either, well, yeah, duh. Like I, I knew it was in the scan or, or people are like really, really disturbed by that. And that whether or not people are disturbed is an indication of whether they thought there was something else besides the brain or whether they knew it was all the brain. So, so I think, I think maybe this was in the, the very bad wizards interview, or, or I don't remember if it was in one of the papers, but there, there is, you know, you've run a lot of experimental studies on this. Um, and some, some percentage of people are still disturbed by the, uh, you know, the fact that the brain, so uh, this is more of a methodology question, but are a lot of, I assume that it's fairly often young people that you're interviewing, I have to think that that view is, is more disturbing to older, maybe non-scientific people, right? Yeah, there ha I haven't done a lot of demographics on this. There have been some interesting uh, studies done cross-culturally and cross-age ranges. Um, most of my studies have been with undergraduates at college, like most psychology. And it, you know, that audience tends to, even though, especially at, you know, my, the universities I've been at, Florida State and Georgia State, there's plenty of very religious people. Um, and there's plenty of people who, um, you know, have not sort of imbibed the, uh, the um, you know, modern scientific view of the way the brain explains everything. They have, they have some dualist intuition. And we can measure that a little bit in these studies by asking them various questions. Again, there's a lot of debate about this. And my former collaborator, Thomas Nadelhofer, and other people like Josh Green and lots of others will say, look, when you give people a study, as I have, and you say, imagine the future, we have perfect brain scanners, and they can see exactly what's going on in Jill's brain while she's uh, making choices over 30 days, and they never get it wrong because they can see what's happening in her brain right before she makes a choice, predict what she's going to do. And even when she tries to fool them, they, they can see she's trying to trick them at the last minute or if she changes her mind. So you give them this scenario. And, you know, in my studies, about 80% of people will say that's possible. So First of all, you would predict that if people were like hardcore substance dualists, 
they would say, no, that's not possible because you can't scan her her soul. soul. Yeah. <laughs> and if her soul is trying to make a choice that tricks your brain scanner, you won't be able to predict it before the soul comes in and you know changes the choice at the last minute. Notice how theoretical that view is I just described. It's like the soul is able to interact with the brain and change things. I mean, you have to have kind of a Cartesian worldview to have that much theory. I don't think most people, even if they have dualist intuitions, have that much theory. I think they just think, wow, our experience of the world is miraculous. It's the feeling of love, the taste of a lemon, the, the, you know, the, the sound of a trumpet. How the hell would you, the, the experience of imagining future alternatives, how the hell would a bunch of stuff going on electrochemically in the brain explain that? So they do have that kind of dualist intuition, the same one that actually probably you and I still have, which is, I don't know how that works. <laughs> How's that neurons? Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and so we don't have that Galilean theory of neuroscience. Mm. Um, my screen has me looking really weird right now. Is yours? Oh, no, you look just as weird as you did when you start when we started. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can edit as necessary. Um, <laughs> sure. something, something seems to be happening. It's fine screen. for me. Okay. Good. So in any case, um, we don't have that sort of Galileo of neuroscience yet to explain how this mushy electrochemical activity in the brain gives us all those wonderful experiences. But at least you and I, and lots of other people raised in a neuroscientific worldview, think it'll happen. You know, they'll figure it out at some point, and it's not that freaky. So the subjects of these experiments I'm doing, I, I think, fall into three categories. One is the hardcore dualist who thinks that's impossible. And if it happened, we would not have free will. And my best guess is that's about 20% of the ordinary Western population. Maybe it's more, um, but it's not as it's not even all of your sort of religious people. Um, so in addition to that sort of 20% of, of traditional, maybe theoretical dualists, I think there's a big chunk of people, maybe 60%, let's just estimate, that we'll call theory light, um, where the last 20% are going to be the theoretically laden philosophers and scientists who have a sort of, you know, naturalistic worldview worked out. Some of you are scientists who think that means we don't have free will, and some are compatibilist philosophers who think, no, that's, that's the naturalistic view that explains free will. But that middle 60% is the target audience that I want to work with. That's the people that I want to help. If you want to call it revision, you can, but I don't think it's so much revision as just sort of elucidation of what presumably we're going to discover over the next 50, 100 years, which is here's how all those miraculous things that you, know, you understand as your mind does except it's the brain that's allowing it to happen or the brain and the body or the brain and body situated in the natural world and when they come to see this it's going to be not a surprise because they didn't have a theory that it conflicts with a sort of robust theory it's just going to be a filling out of this theory light view that says we definitely do something pretty amazing and, and different from what we think most other animals do, although they have it to some degree. We do conscious imagining, rational you know, thoughts about how we should make decisions about grad school, planning, um, self-control, willpower, exercising willpower to you know, not do something we strongly feel like doing. These are all pretty amazing abilities that humans certainly have more developed than anything else we know about in the universe, presumably because our brain is more complicated than anything in the known universe. And again, that's where the action is. That's where we need to figure out to what degree is it working in the way that we ordinarily experience 
not ordinarily theorize about, but ordinarily experience in our day-to-day, -day, you know, interactions with each other and ourselves when we're introspecting. And how much does it conflict with that? Yeah. So you're almost pointing to like a, um, it's almost like a type of meta priming for those 60% of, of centrists or theory light people where, uh, you know, I, I take it that this is how you would explain findings like Nichols and Nob, or I think Vos and Schooler have a finding like this, <clears throat> where if you tell people that free will doesn't exist, you get all these, what you call bad results. People will cheat more, people will be dishonest in certain ways, but you know, a lot of a lot of just negative things will result from that. And I take it that you would think that that is due to this. <clears throat> it's like, it's like a, like a false priming we've in telling them you don't have this thing. They're sort of implicitly figuring out, Oh, well, that means I should have wanted it. And since I don't have it, then, you know, F being a good person or whatever. So that's, that goes to the question I, I ask you. I, I actually wonder if this view is committed to, I think I called it, neuropaternalism, which I don't even mean in a pejorative sense, really, but it's sort of like, it's this view where, okay, we understand that if you tell people they don't have this thing, that actually they should have never wanted in the first place, libertarian free will, because it's an illusion or, or incoherent or whatever, then they will be upset and react in all these bad ways that you point out. So you almost set up like this kind of interesting tiered commitment of talking about these things where you have to first disabuse people of the idea that setting, I guess, the whatever percent of professional philosophers who are libertarians aside, right? You, you don't even want this sense of freedom if you thought you did want it. And then we can talk about how, you know, it, all of the neuroscience details and, and the priming details, the social psych stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, just Continuing with our toy examples of percentages, right? Yeah. Um, the idea would be, look, uh, first of all, by the way, it's, it's actually remarkable that among professional philosophers, the percentages of <laughs> compatibilist, compatibilist, libertarian, and, and skeptic kind of map on to what I'm suggesting most ordinary people think. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, most, philo most professional philosophers are compatibilists and then um you know a small percentage are libertarians yeah and a small percentage are skeptics because they thought you needed libertarian powers but we know that we don't have them but among ordinary people going back to the toy percentages which i'm you know making up based on some empirical work but it's it's very complicated among the percent who are sort of hardcore dualists uh uh hardcore you know libertarians and they're committed to that it's true that if you tell them that that's an illusion they will be uh well they won't believe you um but if <laughs> right i mean for the most part they won't believe you uh but if you tried to convince them that they're wrong and tried to show it to them they might come around and then i don't know exactly what they would do at that point some of them might get depressed and uh and be more likely to cheat or steal, but um, but I don't think that's going to be many people. The much larger percent will be the theory like people who don't know exactly how free will works, um, but they do think that we have remarkable powers of self control and the ability to, you know, put aside short term interests for long term goals and things like that. Now you come along and you just tell them. There's no such thing as free will. It's an illusion. You don't tell them exactly why. And if you do, you just tell them things like, well, because the neuroscientists discovered it and they're smart. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're just telling them like educated people don't believe in this thing. And you don't even tell them what free will means in that case, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, you might, so you might a little bit tell them you know, what, you, what you might tell them as people like Jerry Coyne. Uh, does in a, in a USA Today article mm. says, you know, people don't make choices. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> well, they don't make a certain type of choice. They yeah. don't make a type of choice that is controlled by a non physical soul that is uninfluenced by the laws of nature. I agree with you, Jerry. They don't. But that doesn't mean they don't make choices. And if you tell them they don't make choices, the people who don't believe in the non-physical soul 
are just going to think they don't do what they think they do all the time, however it's done. And the people that do believe in that are, you know, not going to know what to think exactly, but uh, you're, you know, they're, they're not going to, they're still going to think that they don't have the sort of ordinary powers of self-control that even Jerry Coyne thinks we have. So you're in this weird position where you're telling people something that might be interpreted to mean, like you said earlier, yeah, I just, I shouldn't exert these powers that I felt like I had of self-control or whatever. That may explain some of these results. However, let me point out that those results are a mess and it's not clear, it's not clear that they, are replicable, it's not clear when they occur, why they occur. Um, it depends on what primes you use. Uh, and I, I did some work with some of the psychologists and Thomas Nadelhofer to try to figure out when it's happening and how. And the answer is um, the effects are small and it's not clear what's causing them when they are caused. But my best guess, is that their cause because you're basically telling people whatever powers of self-control or rational thinking you thought you had, you don't. And, and then some people are like, okay, well then I guess I won't worry about exercising as much. Yeah. Yeah. That might be a good place to end. And it might be a good place to end because we're <laughs> up against the time slot. Sure. Uh, Eddie, thanks so much for doing this. And, and where can people, I guess I'll link to your, you have a personal website or well, personal in a professional context. Uh, sure, edinomius.com. Yeah. You can link to that. Um, and yeah, you can figure out a good way to kind of wrap it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you can you can add this part if you want. Thank you very much for uh, for this discussion because it was really uh, it was really fun talking to you. And I hope you get into whatever program you are most excited about for the reasons uh, and not because of uh, influences that you don't even know about. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, I want to thank Eddie again for joining me. I really enjoyed our talk and I hope you did too. Even though you might have been able to tell we had a bit of uh, connection issues um, and a bit is understating it. But I think the final product turned out well. If you want to support me and what I'm doing, you can share this show on Twitter or social media. You can rate it on Apple Podcasts or like this video or uh, subscribe via RSS feed or on YouTube. And you can also get in contact with me. You can email me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com and follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And all of those links and the ones to Eddie's papers will be listed in the description below. So as always, thank you for listening and keep struggling to escape the cave.